Now, Target 100 has partnered with TEDx Sydney to challenge people to take the time, uh, learning how basically things are produced. So how is our, our lamb and our beef produced so that we can make informed decisions? And, and what happened was that two lucky TEDx winners, two city slickers, they were sent over to the bush, they went on to the farm, and they were there to offer a, basically a unique chance to see how farming was done in Australia. So what we're going to do now is we're going to watch a video uh, about their time in the bush, and then you're going to be joined by ABC's Landline's Pip Courtney, and, and she's going to be chatting with Barry Trail, who's one of our TEDx uh, Sydney speakers, and also the station owners um, from Mount Riddick, Beck and Steve Cadzo, and the two winners. So let us now find out if agriculture and wilderness can coexist, and what role does technology play in the bush? So here we are, keen at the airport, very excited about the adventure ahead. We're going to a farm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not really sure what to expect actually, I think it's going to be very hot. I'm Stephen Cadzo, I'm from Mount Riddick. I run this place with my wife. We sustainably farm beef cattle in central Australia in the rangeland. We run about 8,000 up to 9,000 on, on average. This is Alice Springs. Oh, it's really hot. <laughs> Okay, I don't know where the handbrake is. Very excited to be on my way to Mount Reddick Station. Won this amazing competition run by Target 100 to go, um, yeah, check out a cattle station. An experience of a lifetime. Introducing them to our lifestyle and amazing technology and innovation in the parcel industry. It's great to get you here, Thank Amelia you. and David, and we have got lots, lots and lots organised for you tomorrow. Helicopter! So this morning we're going up in a helicopter. You're doing some mustering of cattle. Oh, there they are. So you've got over 140 kilometres of cover and tend to the properties. The helicopter is a really crucial tool out here. First time I've ever been a quad bike. My heart was absolutely racing. I wasn't sure if they were going to run back at me or anything like that. If they do, the other stuff were going to be there to help save me. Amelia, what I have here is our ear tags. Yeah, we have a different colour for every year. And then we come to these little things. This is a Nils tag. We have a little chip, and the chip sends a digital number to the reader. Every beast that we have has a lifetime traceability. We can see if they're stolen, check their weights, and the new technology that's coming out is what we call walkover way. So when the cattle come into water, this will be read, their weight will be collected, and the data through the telemetry system will be sent back to the homestead. We'll set up parameters at home. So they come in here, the cattle will then be drafted, and they have to come to water, so that 90% of the work that we're doing here today will be done without a human being being anywhere near them. We'll be able to be more efficient elsewhere on the station while this job's doing itself. Water is the lifeblood of everything that lives out here and we don't have natural water holes. Every bit of water we get has to come out of the ground. All our outlying bores, we have them on a observant telemetry system. Telemetry, basically what it does is it tells us remotely what's happening at this bore. It tells us how much water's in the tank and it sends it back to our system base unit. Remotely stop and start, it's just a click. You can put in how many hours you want it to run for and then just hit start and it, and it starts. So instead of one of you going out there, yeah. like spending an hour going there? Yeah, 180 to 200 kilometres a week in, in savings and travel. If we went overseas, we could uh, get on an iPhone, click on the app and just bring up all our information. All these little things helping make life a lot more efficient because it's really hard out here. So Amelia, we just wanted to show you how much land care we've done in the last 24, 26 years of being on that mm -hmm. rig. So these are pictures of the start of a ponding bank. What's a ponding bank? Well, it's where you catch the water. You only want to catch it for a short amount of time so it will pond and then set it into the ground. And you can see now that we've got up to 10 different grass species and shrubs and that really is a demonstration of how healthy the soil here is now and how big the seed bank is within that soil. So we know that we've got a healthier patch of land than what we started off with 10 years ago. If we don't have our soil in check with our land care practices, there's no point in being here. And we want to be able to hand it over to our children in a much better condition in which we received it. We're not going to sit here and just do the same things our grandfathers have done for the last 100 years. We're continuously reading 
and talking to scientists to look at the new ideas and practices that are in our field and we're trying to encapsulate them and put it into practice on our place. I love being so far away from everything. Ooh. Wow. Have you ever milked a cow? Not a, not a real one. <laughs> about school there is that you get to see your teachers. Very different from a mainstream school. Raya Lisa. Uh, yep, pop them on. See you at you. TEDx? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank Thanks. you so much for coming. Bye guys. Yeah, it's been such an amazing journey. I'm sure we'll be back here one day. Outback Adventure is over. They're back in their native environment of Sydney and now we get to find out what impact the trip had, them, had on them and to the CADs out. So, Amelia, can you tell us what perception did you have of the Australian beef industry before you headed off? Right, before we went away, I mean, I, personally, I love meat and I've eaten meat my whole life. I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. But to be honest, I don't think I'd thought too much exactly about where my meat would come from. It's so disconnected from, you know, the actual process. It just comes to you in, from the butcher. In, it's just a shape, basically, a delicious shape. Um, but so I think um, it was really exciting to actually learn exactly where, you know, or the process the cows go through and to ultimately become... Meat. <laughs> and what about you, David? What were your perceptions? Were they from Twitter? Were they from the media? Were they from your mates in the office? I think they were from my mates in the UK and um, movies. So I thought it was like desert, nothing could really live out there. So I was really curious to see how you could actually have a, uh, a station, a cattle station, and have all this life and keep breeding livestock. So it was, I just thought it couldn't be done. And then I got my mind changed. Did yeah. you think much about meat when you went to the supermarket or you ordered steak or lamb in a restaurant? Um, well, I knew it just didn't magically appear in a supermarket, but I didn't know anything on, in the process before that. Like, I had vague ideas and I, I saw maybe some bad things in the media or like just mm. some anecdotal stuff, but I wanted to know the whole truth, so this was a great experience to, yeah. and to see that. You hear some negative press sometimes with the live cattle trade as well. I personally didn't really understand much about, you know, what actually was going into that, is that happening everywhere, all that sort of stuff. So it was really good to sort of get, have an eye-opening experience, really. Yeah. Yeah. So off you went to this massive cattle station. Steve and Rebecca, can you paint us a picture of what Mount Riddick is like? Where is it? What do you do? And what are the challenges of living and trying to make a living there? Uh, well, Mount Riddick's 200 kilometres northeast of Alice Springs, so it's in the centre of Australia. Um, our closest town is Alice Springs, it's our only town, so isolation is very, like it's something you've got to get used to. Education is also another challenge that we have. At home, um, all of our, we have three daughters, um, they're all enrolled with Alice Springs School of the Air, but within that we have such a huge base of technology to make sure that education happens. Um, the landscape, we have a variety of different landscapes. We have a massive mountain range that runs from one end of the place to the other, which is 160 kilometres long. Um, to drive around the place takes all day, sometimes two days, depending on the, the weather and the road conditions. We have to maintain our own roads. Um, I think you've just got to be very resilient, and even though lots of challenges are thrown at you every day, you've got to be able to think outside the square to get there which is why we've implemented so much technology to make sure that we're more efficient. Well, Steve, tell us about the, the cattle that you run. What, what sort are they? How many can you run? We've got um, eight, eight to 9,000 head of cattle, uh, pole herefords. Um, we're supposed to call them herefords now, but we, we still call them pole herefords. Um, we go from, we, we supply the feedlot market to the, to the slaughter market. Uh, we, we can send cattle off at any time and we just try and keep them in the, uh, the best possible condition we can at any, any one time. And how many workers do you need to help you run 9,000 Herefords? We have a Borman, he, his job is to look after all the watering points and, and pump the water for us. 
Um, I have two other stockmen and myself and, pretty, oh, and, and a truck driver as well and he takes all our cattle to market. Um, what, what sort of landscape is it? Are there trees? Is it just grasslands? Is it like the Barclay Tablelands? Paint us a picture for what it looks like. No, it, it's the landscape that has changed dramatically over the years. The uh, original uh, family that took it up said that you could uh, gallop a horse from our, our homestead to the neighbouring homestead and not dodge or swerve for a bush. So over the 70 odd hundred years that it's been uh, a cattle station, it, it's dramatically changed. We have a lot of scrub there now, um, as well as grass. Um, the, the, the scrub and the grass, uh, like the, the scrub is also edible. So we have a standing um, uh, feet, haystack, to, to, for want of a better word, and, and one on the ground. So it complements each other. So it's big, it's remote, and the nearest shop's 200 k's away. Yeah. Um, Dr Barry Trail, can you tell us, uh, do you think grazing is compatible with the environment where Mount Riddick gives? Well, look, I, I'll, I'll go to a, something that a grazer, Kelsey Nielsen, um, not that far from the Cadzo, said to me uh, a few years ago. She, she leaned forward intens intensely and said, Barry, you've got to understand, not many people want to live in a remote outback Australia. And you, you and other people need to do things that support people. And she was dead right, because of a fundamental to me, and I think from you know, the great majority of conservationists, is understanding that the country needs to be managed. If the country is empty of people, if it, fire is not managed, invasive feral animals are not managed, camel, feral camels, uh, all sorts of things, Weeds. then it will degrade. So yes, I, I do think that there is some country that it's not compatible with commercial grazing enterprises. It's, it's too fragile, it's too, too significant for biodiversity, for nature. Uh, but in the great spread of outback country, there's, there's obviously very, some very good cattle country uh, with people managing well like the Cadzos. Uh, and doing a great job, and nature is also protected. So does, does that mean that cattle can literally, if they're managed the right way and there's no overstocking, can be like little land managers? Yes. 9,000 of them? Hmm. Yes, well, they're, they're a bit... Uh, they're, they, they're very large, gruff, orange and white land managers, but yes. <laughs> Yeah. But they work seven days a week, 24-7. They seven. work seven days a week. Yeah. Very efficient. But a lot of people would say conservation is about either locking it up or, um, you know, letting it be developed. So you're sort of, you're proposing that there's this middle way. Look, if you're talking about a part of Australia which has been largely cleared of bush, say in our wheat belts, just to the west of Sydney, where there might only be a few percent of the original native bush left in the landscape, and the rest is wheat fields, then it is a bit of a black and white issue because that bush left is so precious and is so full of often now rare and endangered species. But if you're talking about our big outback landscapes, what you need is a, to me is a matrix, a mosaic of different land management. It might be some parks, it'll be some cattle stations, it'll be Aboriginal lands managed by indigenous rangers. That is what in the long term will look after the country. The problem we have across much of the outback now is that much of it is empty or increasingly empty of any management, and that's bad for wildlife. Well, the Cadzos have adopted many innovations. Now, if we look at cattle to start with, they all have NLIS tags. Now, Stephen, what is a Mills tag? What do they do? And how do they help you run a better business and more profitable business? Um, a Nils tag is a little electronic device. Um, it's uh, the easiest way to describe it is, is like what uh, the dogs and cats in cities have inserted in them. It's just an electronic identification um, device that can be read with a scanner. It's a digital number and you can record it in your system. Um, so you can record with a computer program you could uh, weight gains, uh, when they are born, uh, w w what their gender is, and you can, it's, a, it's for lifetime traceability. So with our operation, um, w when we uh, brand our cattle, they, they get, get one of these tags in their ear, and it's in there for lifetime. When, when we sell it, 
um, it's recorded and we, we, it's transferred to the next buyer. And it, if it goes on with multiple, um, uh, like gets sold multiple times, it's tra it's traceable. We can get on a computer and we can track that animal for its entire life. If there's a disease outbreak, we know exactly where it's been, or, or the uh, Australian government with the quarantine, they can they can track it where where it's been in its life, so we we can link up. Um, you know, what what areas it has affected. Well, when they were first brought in, it was for that lifetime traceability, but you, with the uh, the weighing systems, and you've managed to have that electronic ear tag help help you manage your animals. How are you doing that? Well, the, the thing that's um, it's not in yet, but it, it's about to go in, is, is the walkover weigh. Um, the, ca the cattle, as they go into water, they, uh, they walk over a weigh bridge, um, their, their tag is read, their weight is recorded, and that's sent back uh, via telemetry, back to the station, to the computer, and it will give us their daily weight gains. And you know, once they get to a certain target weight, we can, uh, there's another facility in that where we can automatically draft those out, and then we just have to go and get, pick them up and, and send them to market. Now, does this reduce the human contact and the need to push animals through yards and muster them with dogs and bikes? Reducing a lot of stress, yes. Yeah. It, it, um, the, the less times you have to, to handle them, the better. Um, but quite, quite handling of your cattle is essential with, with, um, with anything because the moment the cattle gets stressed, you start losing weight. And to us, weight is money because we get paid per kilo. Now, Amelia and David, what did you think about all the technology that allowed computers to see which animals are putting on weight and we can move them to this paddock from, our, from the couch. Yeah, I think um, what really fascinated me was we were hearing a lot about how you know, Beck and Steve are doing things a lot differently to traditional practices, really embracing this change, sometimes taking great risk and financial investment uh, up front in order to you know, make this progress. Um, but I think I really admire that. I think it's fantastic to see risk being taken, calculated risk being taken in order to move the business forward and basically create excellent quality cattle and keep the land um, out in, in check for the future generations. So, yeah. David, did you expect that level of technology to be available? Um, not at that scale or level, but it was very impressive to see and how they have incorporated it and um, embraced it is really eye-opening, but in a great way. It allows them to kind of do more with the same amount of resources, so they can kind of push forward in other things and not just keep their head above water. So it was really inspiring to see that in such a different context to my life and my work, which, which I try and do in, in that area. But it was just great to see other people doing that in a different industry. And did you guys both understand about low-stress stock handling, that that's actually good for the animal and that a lot of producers are trying to reduce reduce that and get people out of the handling? So yep. did, what did, did you, you understand the whole concept of low stress stock handling before you no, went? No, I'd not heard of low stress handling, but it makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, we were told that some, we, we were seeing some cattle come to water and apparently they'd never seen humans maybe once in their whole life. And, you know, they're out on this beautiful outback and just eating yeah. the delicious grass and just having a good, good life. So. It was good to learn about that process, for sure. And I think it makes sense, like a happier cow is a heavier cow, which is a cow which can make more money. So it's in everyone's interest, but it's great that they care about the cow's welfare. And it's not just a product or a commodity. They actually care about it, which yeah. is really good to see. And uh, Rebecca, how has the walkover weighing system changed the business? And does it put more dollars in your pocket and does it make for happier cows? I think it definitely makes for happier cows, which means it's a better end product for the consumer. Um, but for us, it's time efficiency. We don't have to employ those four people for those two days to be out there chasing the cows, walking them down a series of laneways, mustering the paddocks with the helicopters. Um, this is all being done from the computer at the house. So we plug in the numbers that we want, how, what weight range we want, and we go out to the paddock in a day's time, and they're all done. So it's a time efficiency. So during that day, when the walkover weighing's actually doing our job, we get other jobs done. So it's 
huge efficiency, time saving and definitely money saving at the same time as creating a, a better end product. Now we hear a lot about um, computer speeds in the bush. How do you do all this with, um, you know, is it satellite technology and is it reliable? Um, it's actually through the telemetry you're talking about. It's through a company called Observant and it's done with a two-way radio. So um, there's a repeater station above our homestead on one of the mountain ranges that we had to take a helicopter up to put it on. Can I just stop you there? We're just going to say goodbye to our uh, TV audience now and the, the crowd here at TEDx in Sydney will stick with us, but we'll come back to you in a few seconds, but uh, back to the studio.